We know that your ability to communicate with others will account for fully 85% of your success. Even people who are in technical fields, such as computer programmers and engineers, spend 75% of their time interacting with other people. All the great successes in life come from good communications. All the top executives who've been interviewed have said that their ability to communicate well with others is more responsible for their success than anything else. And wonderfully enough, how to communicate is a learned skill. And you can get better and better at it by learning what the best communicators do and practicing it until it becomes a regular part of your repertoire. Number one, there are three parts. There are three parts of any conversation. This goes back to the original work by Aristotle in Aristotle's Rhetoric. A, he said, the first part of conversation is ethos. Ethos has to do with the character of the person. Emerson said, what you are shouts at me so loudly, I can't hear a word you're saying. Character is terribly important. Credibility, believability. It's the character of the person. A person who has high character can say little and be enormously influential. A person like Mother Teresa could say a few words and change a person's life. A person with limited character just doesn't have the same effect. B is pathos. Pathos is the second part of communication. It means connecting with the emotions. And we connect with the emotions when we tune in and focus in on the person and their problems and their needs. As a friend of mine who was selling once said to a client, had been going around in circles, he said, let's stop talking, just tell me, where does it hurt? And he waited. And then the fellow told him what the problems, the real problems were in the company that this consultant could help. Always remember people are carrying a heavy load. There was a wonderful line I read that said, if every person who complains about their problems could come from all corners of the earth and take and pile their problems in a heap, and if each person could see the size and gravity of the problems of others, they would sneak forward shamefacedly and take their petty problems away and creep into the night. And I think it's an interesting thing when you consider that we have problems, but so many other people have vastly greater problems than us. And when you tune in to other people's problems and concerns, it's amazing how much better your life is. And C is logos, is the factual content of the conversation. And the factual content is often the least important, the logos. But until you have established character and connected with the emotions of the other person, the words you say, the argument, is really not relevant. In selling, what do we say? In selling, you establish rapport, which is the character. You seek the underlying problem or need, which is connecting with the pathos. And only then do you talk about your product or service, which is the logos. And in dealing with anybody in, in life, it's those three. Number two, there are three elements to any conversation. According to Albert Morabian, who is a professor of social sciences at the University of California at Los Angeles, UCLA, he said words only account for 7% of the message. When you talk, it's only 7% is the words. That's why they say in speaking, people will forget most of what you say, but they will remember the way you said it. And B is the tone of voice accounts for fully 38%. Women, by the way, are far more sensitive than men. The rule is that women have a much richer inner life than men. And women are very sensitive to tones of voice and a very tiny changes in tones of voice. How many men have heard this? I know I have. When I said, well, I just said this, she said, it's not what you said. It's your tone of voice. So, tone of voice is important, and that's why we need to give some thought to it, because if we're in a hurry or busy or rushed, sometimes our tone of voice can be clipped or short, and it can be hurtful. C is body language accounts for fully 55% of your communication. And the rule is that people believe the dominant message. What message is dominant? For example, if you say, well, do you love me? Yeah, sure, I love you. Do people believe the words or the dominant message, which is the body language and the tone of voice? They say, yes, I love you. Then they believe the totality. 
And that's why the very best message is a message that is synchronized. The words, the tone of voice, and the body are all synchronized to the message. Very important. That's why when somebody talks to you, it's important you turn toward them and face them directly when you talk to them and listen closely to what they say and nod and pay attention. That's very important than saying, yeah, I'm listening. Yeah, go ahead, I'm listening. Over the back of your shoulder. Very important. I taught this to parents, by the way, a very simple thing. When you have small children and you talk to your children, get down at their eye level. It is so immensely different for a child. Rather than looking up at a giant, to have their parent looking at them, eye level to eye level. Very important. Number three is there are four basic personality styles. And these personality styles you're very familiar with. We divide people into four quadrants based on two spectrums. The first is the spectrum of indirect communicators. People who are indirect versus direct or outgoing. And the second is people orientation versus task orientation. And this gives us four different types of personality. We have people up in this quadrant who we call relators. The relator is very high on people orientation and indirect. They're quiet, they're self-contained, they're not expressive, they're sensitive, they're people-oriented, they're concerned about people's opinions. And of course, you can go to extremes with these. You can go way up to extremes, and up in the extreme, the person here will be hypersensitive to the opinions of others. If you're selling or communicating, this type of person requires slow, low-key, easygoing, friendly, warm. They want to get to know about you, ask you questions. Like people will come up to me at a seminar and say, Hi, how are you? Uh, tell me all about your life and how you got started and what you think and feel about what it's going to happen for you for the next 20 years and what you really care about and love more than anything else in life. Could you tell me that? <laughs> well, there's a lineup of people behind them. And I'll say, well, those are wonderful questions. That is what they're interested in. They're genuinely interested in knowing about you. So if you're dealing with relators, you have to go slowly. You have to be patient. You can't be pushy. They take time to make decisions, and they like to talk to other people. Their primary concern in life is, let's get along. Let's get along. Let's all be friends. They're really grieved or pained if there's any kind of friction amongst people. Now, the next type of person is the analyzer. This person is an indirect person, self-contained, but very task-oriented. This is the kind of person who's not concerned so much about people up here, but they're very concerned about doing the job, and they're kind of inward-directed. This type of person, at the extreme, can be an uncommunicative bureaucrat, very meticulous and picky about every detail. But their primary concern is, let's be accurate. Let's be accurate. By the way, relators tend to gravitate toward fields where relators are most effective. So a relator will gravitate toward a field like nursing, social services, teaching, small child development, psychology, things where they deal with people, administrative functions, personnel, counseling, and so on, where they relate to other people. The analyzer who's fastidious and detail-oriented, just the facts, and I want to be accurate, where do you think they'll gravitate to? Computers, accounting, engineering, bookkeeping, any field where meticulous numbers are concerned, they like problems that don't talk back. Now the third type of person is what we call the director. The director is a person who is outgoing, direct, and task-oriented. These people are bottom line oriented, just the facts, they're impatient, they make quick decisions. They don't need a lot of detail. They're the ones that read the summaries of the summaries. And these people are concerned with, let's get results. Who do you think would read the most copies of People magazine so far? The Relator. Who do you think would read Success magazine, Business Week, Forbes, The Director, The Go-Getter, The Kick You-Know-What and Take Names? And then you get people who are very uh, extreme directors, and these are dictators, they're tyrannical, they're angry, they're directive, they're short-tempered, they have no patience at all. This type of person, you've got to get right to the bottom line. Don't waste time saying, hi, how you doing, how's everything going, 
fine for the relator, but the people who are task oriented on the bottom are not the type. They just don't have the patience. And the fourth is what is called the socializer. And the socializer is a person who is outgoing, direct, voluble, and very people oriented. This person's primary motivation is achievement and achievement with and through other people. They like to talk about achievement. What are you doing? What did you do? How did it work? Let me tell you what I did and how it worked for me. They're very achievement oriented. They're socializers. They're also called expressives. Sometimes they're called executives because they're very integrated. They have a very strong focus on people and a very strong focus on achievement and getting things done. Everybody here is in one of these quadrants. Now here's the basic rule. The mistake that people make is they treat everybody else as though everyone else is the way they are. However, no matter what you are, three quarters of the people you meet are something else. Now there's no right or wrong or better or worse style. However, your job in asking questions and listening to people is to find out which style they are and then to practice personality flexibility so that you can get along with a greater number of different types of people. Here's one more thing is that whatever you are, the person you are most ideal for will be the opposite. Nature demands balance in temperament and nature demands that the opposite person in your relationship be temperamentally balanced with you. So for example, with me, I'm in this quadrant, which is what you might call a socializer director or a socializer director. I'm in this quadrant right here. My wife is over here. She would be an analyzer relator. And so, whereas I will say, come on, let's get on with it. Let's get the job done. What the heck? Yay. She'll say, just a minute. Let's check everything. So whatever you are, you'll be most compatible. If you're a director, you'll find people who are directors who are really strong, result oriented, bottom line, kick, you know what, take names and so on. They will be matched ideally with a person who's a relator. Very easygoing, friendly, warm, charming, people oriented and so on. Nature demands balance and temperament. Okay, number four, the person who asks questions has control. The person who asks questions has control. Remember, this is one of the keys to power in communications is that you ask good questions and listen carefully to the answers. A, you ask open-ended questions. Open-ended questions are questions that start with pronouns. What, where, when, who, how, and why? What are you doing now? How is that working? When did you start that? Where did it begin? How did it occur? Who is involved? These are questions that open up. They cannot be answered with yes or no. An open-ended question, how is it going? Cannot be answered yes or no. B is a closed-end question. Now, a closed-end question is a question that you use to bring a conversation to a close. And these are questions that start with verbs. And a verb is are, is, have, are you ready to make a decision? Is this what you want? Have you made up your mind yet? So when you start a question with a verb, you demand a yes or no, a conclusion. And C is preference questions. Now, preference questions are questions where you give the person a choice. And remember, people love choices. People love choices. So you say, which would you prefer, this or that? Which do you like, that or the other thing? Which of these would be better for you? Always giving people choices makes it much easier for people to make decisions. People don't like to have only one choice. So even if you only have one choice, you say, then when would you like it, here or next week? Would you like it sent to your home address or to your office address? Would you like to pay by cash, credit card, or our term payments? In other words, trying to give people choices makes it much easier for them to buy or to go along with it. Number five key to communications is a balanced dialogue. A balanced dialogue means no monopolizing. The very best conversations are conversations that have an ebb and flow like the tide. Go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. There's an easy, relaxed flow back and forth. And if the people are together for 10 minutes or 10 hours, the conversation goes back and forth. There's a thing called the conversation test. And it is a test of the compatibility of two people. We know that in the ideal conversation, each person will get a chance to talk and each person will get a chance to listen and there will be about a 10% to 15% period of easy silences. 
easy silence, just comfortable. People are comfortable with the silence. And so, in the ideal conversation, each one will get a chance to talk, each one will get a chance to listen. And by the way, each of us have needs, like vitamin and mineral needs, to talk, and each of us have needs to listen. What can often happen, however, is some people will have 70% of the time they need to talk, and the other person, 70% of the time they need to talk, and so they're always clashing because they're both trying to get their talking out. The worst of all is when incompatibility sets in in a relationship, and both of them only need to talk 10 or 15% of the time, and then there's vast gaps of uncomfortable silence. This is where the two people really don't have very much in common anymore. They don't have much to say. When they come together, they come together, they usually have an easy ebb and flow, but over time kind of dries up. Have you ever seen a couple driving along in a car? Both of them look straight ahead. Nobody says anything. Or they sit in a restaurant and they eat. And sometimes they read and they don't say anything. Not a good sign. Number six is acknowledge and agree. In good conversation, they acknowledge and agree twice as often. Good conversationalists are active conversationalists. Uh huh, uh huh, yes, uh huh, yeah, oh, that's, that's it, uh huh, that, that's right, look at that, back, good. They're there, they're not sitting there passively like fence posts, they're actually engaged. So active listening is very, very important in relationships. Active listening means the person is really there. Put down the magazine or newspaper, turn off the television set, lean in, be there the whole time. Number seven, good listening skills. And sometimes people are shy, and I can tell you this, the way that you overcome your shyness is very simply this, tune into the other person, ask questions, and then listen carefully to the answers. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. Get out of yourself and don't be preoccupied with what the other person is thinking about you. Instead, focus on encouraging the other person to talk about them. The more the person is talking about themselves, the more they like you. Seek first to understand, then to be understood. When you go home at night, don't talk about your day at all. Instead, ask her and ask the kids about their days and listen closely and ask them follow-up questions and probe. In fact, I'll give you a secret for success in life. Treat the members of your family like you treat your customers, especially your best customers. And you'll be absolutely amazed at what a wonderful person you just became. Number eight, listening skills. Listening builds trust, the foundation of all relationships. The more you listen, the more the person trusts you. The more they trust you, the more they like you. The more they like you, the more they open up to you. So treat your members of your family, treat everybody you meet as though they were your best customers, your very best customers. Their jokes will be funnier, the conversation will be more interesting, you'll pay better attention, you'll have far more patience. Just try that. Number nine, here are the listening skills, the keys to success with people. A, listen attentively. And by the way, as I mentioned, women are wonderful communicators. They're fabulous listeners, they're far better than men. Men are 95% more likely to interrupt a woman than a woman is to interrupt a man. B, let's pause before replying. When you pause before replying, it raises the self-esteem of the other person because it tells the other person that you're carefully considering what they said rather than just jumping in. And C, question for clarification. Question for clarification, always ask, how do you mean? How do you mean exactly? How do you mean? Well, that's interesting. How do you mean? Well, that's pretty good. How do you mean exactly? And then listen and practice listening. And finally, D, feed it back. Paraphrase it in your own words. Remember, when you can paraphrase what the person said, this is the real test of listening. This is where you really prove that you are really listening. So paraphrase it in your own words. Well, let me make sure I understand what you said. You're concerned about this, and this happened, and that, that's what happened? Aha! Uh -huh. And take the time to paraphrase. And re think about paraphrasing while you're listening, and you'll always be a better listener.